I have to delete my Patreon account. It's really annoying, but I'm having to start again from scratch, building up a new Patreon profile. So if you like my work and want to support it, then now more than ever, I would really appreciate you going to my new link, patreon.com forward slash Alex OC, where you'll get early access to episodes as well as getting them ad free. You'll also find at that link information about why I have to delete and restart my Patreon account. This obviously isn't ideal, especially because my channel simply wouldn't be where it is today without Patreon. If you're already supporting me on Patreon, there's information on the old page about why this is happening and what you can do if you want to continue supporting my content. But now I give you David Deutsch. David Deutsch, welcome to Within Reason. Hi. I'm uh, I'm excited to talk to you. I was reading your book just recently on on, a, on an aeroplane, actually, which is why for the for the viewers watching, they may notice it's a slightly different background to usual. I'm I'm in a hotel room, well, a motel room in Miami, and you're currently balanced on top of a microwave and a suitcase, so that accounts for the change in circumstance. Um, I was reading your book on the plane over here, the beginning of infinity, and right at the very beginning, you talk about the nature of our universe. You talk about our planet being part of a solar system and the solar system being part of a galaxy, the galaxy part of a universe. And then rather confidently, you say that this universe is part of a multiverse, just one universe among many others. I hear people talk about this as a, as a matter of conjecture all the time, but the confidence with which you painted a picture of this multiverse into the very beginning of your book made me want to start by asking, what gives you such confidence that this multiverse exists? I don't know if um, confidence is the right word. Um, I have as much confidence in quantum theory as I do in any of the other um, superb theories of physics, which are our best knowledge of the world. Um, uh, the fact that uh, all these decades after um, I, it's it's almost a century since the theory was proposed, and half that time it has been known that it describes a multiverse, and yet that proposition is still um, disputed by most physicists. Uh, when I say most, people ask me how many. I don't know, <laughs> but but um, those who um adopt the um uh, many universes form of uh quantum theory or everettian quantum theory as it's called um after hugh everett uh, who proposed it in 1957 are uh perhaps 10% of theoretical physicists but the proportion is much higher in certain branches of physics where you have to uh, have to actually ask what is happening to bring about the predictions that uh, quantum theory makes, rather than just using the predictions as a sort of almanac. Um, and um, philosophically, I, I think that, um, I, and uh, yes, so one of the excuses that's commonly made is to call this an interpretation of quantum theory rather than calling it quantum theory. That that's a kind of a trick. It's a bit right. like uh, creationists calling um, the theory of e evolution an interpretation of fossils. Right. Because after all, no one's ever seen a dinosaur. No one's ever seen other universes. Uh, no one's ever seen. Um, uh, and and um, fossils are actually stone, uh, which is just evidence of dinosaurs not actual dinosaurs and similarly um interference phenomena are just evidence of other universes they are not themselves other universes so the the logical connection between these things is very tight it's the same ex level of excuses being made um so as, so you mean to say that your uh, you said confidence is the wrong word, and perhaps yeah. it is, but but your confidence in the truth of something like a multiverse is similar to your confidence in the truth of something like evolution by natural selection on yes. the basis of the available evidence. Yes, I mean that's that's quite that's quite extraordinary, and and I, I want to jump into to why that is and and why quantum uh, physics does point to a to a multiverse. But but 
just beforehand, you said you don't know how many scientists are on one side or the other of this debate. But for those who aren't in agreement with you here, for those who don't look at this evidence and see it obviously pointing to a multiverse, why do you think that happens if, as far as you can see, this is a, a, a fairly straightforward um, deduction to make from the from the evidence? Why are so many people missing it? Um, well, it's not a deduction. It's it's the usual thing. It's 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 the only known explanation of the evidence. Just like in the case of uh, dinosaurs, that we know they existed. Um, so why why has this happened in physics? Well, uh, I don't know. Uh, is the short answer. It's some kind of sociological phenomenon of twentieth century physics. You have to remember that. Um, at the time when quantum theory was proposed, um, there were very few physicists in the world, um, uh, especially um, th fundamental theoretical physicists. Uh, they all knew each other. It was a little um, culture, um, a little subculture or a little society of its own, and it, and it uh, was therefore unstable to small numbers of in influential ones of them, um, grabbing onto a false doctrine. Now, that, that wouldn't matter because ultimately all doctrines turned out to, turn out to be false in science, but um, trying to enforce it dogmatically, trying to um, uh, put down questions like what brings about the outcome trying to put down those questions as being illegitimate questions. Like, if you ask that, you haven't understood quantum theory, or else nobody can understand quantum theory. You're not supposed to understand it. Or quantum theory isn't supposed to be a theory of the world. It's supposed to be a theory of how we see the world. And uh, that kind of thing, all of, all of which uh, are well-known excuses in all sorts of other areas. Um, but in, in physics, they've somehow become entrenched. And some people say it's because the original generation then trained their students to fear to ask certain questions. It might be that. It, it, it might be something in the wider society. Um, the same thing could have happened in relativity. Um, Einstein, when he was young, was very strongly influenced by um, the positivism of, of uh, various people, including especially Mach, Ernst Mach, who, who was a physicist, but also a, a, a very um, emphatic um, positivist philosopher. And uh, early... Uh, relativity was in fact inspired <laughs> by this positivistic insistence on uh, let's just ask questions about what we can see rather than the absolute space uh, underneath it. Well, uh, so and and um, Einstein, in a certain sense, took that to heart by saying there is no such thing as the absolute space. There's only uh, relative times and distances, and therefore, for example, simultaneity doesn't exist. So, um, uh, but when it came to general relativity, um, that didn't work. <laughs> you couldn't say that the underlying space-time doesn't exist, because the underlying space-time is actually the substance of um, general relativity. And sure. so Einstein had to drop positivism completely and go, go across exactly to the opposite uh, extreme, um, which is why he rejected the um, growing consensus about quantum theory. This is often said to be um, a case of Einstein rejected quantum theory, but that, that's not, not at all true. He rejected the... the um, view of it, the excuses that were put forward by its pioneers for not taking it seriously as a theory of reality. So talk to me about the kind of phenomena that we're observing in quantum mechanics that leads us to this, 
yes. to this, so this, the, this, this amazing this amazing conclusion that 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 we've yes. been talking about so far. Yes, uh, it's one of the most amazing things that that physics has discovered. Though I don't think the most amazing, but one of the most amazing. Um, one way of looking at it is uh, traditionally the way that people have looked at it is to look at the theory and just say, well, let's apply what we've been taught as physicists, as students, how to connect the equations of the theory with predictions about reality. And you can labor through that process. The, 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 the first people who proposed um, the many universes version of quantum theory did in fact go by that route. Um, they were, Schrodinger came up with the idea um, just before Everett, probably in the early 50s, but he never published it. Uh, so Everett was the one who first published it. Um, and so their accounts are rather mathematical. They're saying, look at the theory, let's do what we normally do and not make excuses for not believing the, 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 what, what the uh, theory plainly says, that sort of thing. Now, I, if, if you're not a physicist, uh, appealing to that training is not very convincing. <laughs> so I'd rather go by a different route and say, well, how do we explain the experiment? So the, uh, th there are very many experiments now, and they are completely uncontroversial. Um, they are, they are the um, outcomes of these experiments are used in other experiments and in um, technology and so on. So there's no doubt about what will happen in the experiment. It's just that the prevailing view is to shut up and calculate. In other words, don't ask about how the outcome comes about. And the simplest case is the famous two slit experiment or multiple slit experiment where a single yeah. particle is aimed uh, it, it should say that a, a single particle is is in quantum theory is not quite what it is in in classical physics it's it's spread out a bit um and um which normally doesn't matter because it's spread out by by a very small amount which we uh, can only detect in these specialized experiments but Got to, got to remember that it's spread out a little bit. And, and you have two slits which are separated by less than the amount that the, that the particle is spread out. So you, you can do this uh, experiment at home. I mean, it's not that small a distance. Like, um, a tenth of a millimeter is fine. So you, you make two slits in a barrier, say a tenth of a millimeter apart, and then you aim your laser at it. and um, the result, and then you, you project that picture on a screen uh, a few meters away, um, and uh, you see that instead of just getting a shadow of two, of two slits, or of one slit if the resolution weren't enough, you get an intricate pattern um, called an interference pattern. And it's, it's the same pattern that you would get on a different scale if you if you put a barrier in front of um, some water waves, so water waves also don't produce um, a, a shadow in in the water, but they produce a complicated interference pattern. Um, but now you can you can put a um, a filter, a dark filter, in front of the laser until only one photon is going through at a time. Now this you can't do at home, but you can easily do it in, a, in an optics lab with a, with a photomultiplier to detect the light. And you find that even when the light is going through one photon at a time, and so you only see it on the screen going blip, 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 it still goes blip in that same pattern, identical pattern. So there are places where it sometimes arrives, and there are places where it never arrives. And um, if, you, if you have only one slit open, you, you also get a, a pattern characteristic of one slit, cat pattern characteristic of two slits. You can make three slits, four slits. Each number of slits produces a radically different, apparently radically different pattern. Now, the thing that <laughs> tells us conclusively that there are parallel universes, wait for it, <laughs> is that <laughs> if you look at that there are certain points on the screen where 
photons, let's say you have one slit open, you have where photons are arriving. And if you open the second slit, they stop arriving there. So how come? Well, hmm. uh, obviously, they must stop arriving because they, they know that there are two slits open now and not just one. And if you look at the mathematics of this, what determines whether they arrive or not depends on whether how many slits are open. Is it one, two, five, 17. They all give a different pattern. And the mathematics tells us when opening a new slit will stop light arriving at a given point. So, so to be clear, we're still talking about firing one photon yes. through the same slit as before. Yes. It's just that because we've opened up another slit now, yes. suddenly that photon just isn't going through that slit in, yes. in the same way as it was before. Exactly. So um, then we can do various kinds of experiments. You know, so something must be coming through the other slit, um, something which stops our, our photon, the one we see, finally, or right. the one which our photomultiplier detects. So we, we can do various experiments. Some people, you know, at first, you know, you might think, well, maybe when it comes to the slits, the photon splits in two, and then they join up again before they, before they reach the slit. Well, you can do experiments to show that that, that isn't the case, that you, you can never detect half a photon. You, you know, you, you can only, um, wherever you put the photomultiplier between, between the laser and the slit, if it's going through one photon at a time, then you only ever see one photon or, or none if you if you put it somewhere uh, where the photon isn't. It's only ever one or none, never two, never more than one. Right. So um, then then you can say, well, um, uh, maybe there's something else invisible going through which we can't detect. Well, uh, what? So you can do experiments on the other slit. So when, whenever you detect a photon. You also look at the readings for some other apparatus you put in the way. Um, and you can put, for example, a prism in the way. You can put mirrors in the way so that the, um, whatever's going through the other slit might bounce off the mirror. And you find that if you make it bounce long enough, you get the one slit pattern again. Because the, the, the thing that came through the second slit does not, um, uh, arrives too late to affect the photon we see. Um, huh. uh, so, uh, and then um, because the because the formula for what happens depends also on the phase of the photons, you can put um, a a glass um, filter uh, so to slow down the photon just a little bit, and that actually shifts the the pattern because the the first photon is arriving slightly before but but uh, not long enough before to be unaffected by the second photon so uh, the thing in short the thing that comes through um, behaves like a photon it's deflected by mirrors it's half deflected by half silvered mirrors it's yeah. uh, it's affected by prisms in, in exactly the way a photon is it's just that, that is to say in the way that a particle of, yes. of, of light would, would behave. Yes, yes. Uh, so at these very small amounts of light, it always um, is emitted as particles. So yep. it's always, uh, the photomultiplier detects the particle, and if there's less than a particle there, it, it, it sometimes detects and sometimes not. But when it does, it's always a full particle. Sure. Um, so, so it is light. It's just invisible light. Well, what what does that mean? Well, you can do experiments with the energy and find out whether the energy, some of the energy, is given to the other photon, and the answer is no, and and so on and so on. And uh, the the um, conclusion is that uh, this photon exists always in multiple copies. Even one photon exists in multiple copies of which we can at most ever see one but uh, it, it's uh, you might ask which one well that that's like asking which identical twin am i uh you know they're mm. identical twins 
uh, when we look at the screen, we're seeing one of those photons, but there's another instance of us seeing each of them. Yeah. Okay. So, so let's, let's, let's slow down a bit here because this is, this is really important. So typically when people describe this double split experiment, this double slit experiment, you're firing a, a photon of light, a particle through these slits, and it's acting like a particle. Everything you do to it makes us think that this is a particle that, that we're Which dealing with. Which just means it's yet... localized. It, it doesn't spread out more than... Right. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's this, this tiny little thing, you know? Yeah. And yet, uh, there, there we have sort of contrary information that this, this particle is also acting as if it were a wave interference patterns being sprung up on the screen behind the slits you know it, it seems to be coming out sort of going in as a particle coming out as a wave and depending on what we do with it and how we look at it it either acts like a particle well, or as a wave we only ever see the whole pattern in one go like, like we do with water waves if if mm -hmm. we send through lots of photons at once so that where mm. each one comes out is kind of blurred but yes uh, when we send through one photon at a time then what we see is blip, 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 um, it, it just um, uh, across the screen. By the way, I say blip, blip. Um, this tells you what one photon at a time means. It, like if, if the blips are one second apart, then the actual photons are 186,000 miles apart. You know, there's no way they can affect each other, like successive mm. photons can affect each other. Right, but This right. is a single particle phenomenon. Yeah. Okay. So this is this is confusing. Particle wave. What's going on at the time that this this experiment is is you know, first that this result is first discovered? What's the first reaction of the scientific community uh, as a, a means of explaining what's what's going on here? The first um, way of coping with this was before. Uh, before this, um, well, actually, <laughs> I was going to say before, the, before many people knew of the single photon type experiment, it had actually been done by a guy called G.I. Taylor in early 1900s, but he didn't, he didn't see the significance of it. Um, uh, so the first thing that, that uh, the mainstream physicists thought was that um, the particle was a wave. Um, it's just a wave going through, and the the only reason it's um, uh, only seen in a narrow range of places it, is that it's a wave packet. It's um, it's like if you um, uh, if you if you have a skipping rope and you're kind of uh, making a wave in it, uh, you, you can either make a wave that goes along uh, along the skipping rope, but if you if you suddenly move your hand then then a single called a wave packet moves mm. along the skipping rope and yeah yeah that, like a, li that, a little a little wave will shoot all the way down the skipping rope. yes a little wavelet you can call it yes and it carries energy you know it, the person mm. holding the rope at the other end will feel the the kick uh sure. as, so it was thought that the first thing that was thought was that that maybe light is like that uh, and by the way, later they did experiments to show that electrons and neutrons do exactly the same thing. So light what had been thought to be a wave um, for about 100 years before that. So, But electrons and neutrons had been thought to be particles. But when right. th these phenomena were detected, identical phenomena were detected, then people say, well, maybe all particles are actually waves. Hmm. Um, and so a, a photon would be something like light is a wave and a photon would be something like one of these little wavelets yes. just being sort of shot out um, one at a time. So what's wrong with that interpretation? Why can't we think of photons as just tiny little waves? Um, well, there, there are several things, several, several um, weirdnesses piled up. And the first one, which is perhaps not the most important, but since you seem to want to go back to these these early interpretations. Um, the first thing was the photoelectric effect, which, by the way, Einstein um, discovered why it happens before real quantum theory was invented. It's kind of an early form of quantum theory. Um, the, the problem there was that, you know, the photoelectric effect is just that when light hits a photoelectric cell, 
like you use to, you know, open an automatic door when you approach. Uh, when, when the light beam is interrupted, so the, the electric electricity becomes less, and so on. Um, when you when you um, put brighter light on the photoelectric cell, you get more electricity. When you dimmer light, you get less. Until there's some threshold below which, no matter how many, uh, no matter how much light you you um put on the uh on the photoelectric cell if the energy of each photon is not enough to excite the cell you get nothing so it it's not dependent on the total energy right. um incident on the on the photoelectric cell it's a matter of the the frequency or the energy of each photon so that that tells us that photons come in particles um, mm. That you know, photon ons meant it was a particle, and uh, mm. so that was Einstein's theory. And they gave him the Nobel Prize because, for various nasty reasons, they didn't want to give him the prize for relativity. So, mm. um, so that he he got the prize for that. But later, um, uh, there were experiments with. First of all, there were experiments with silver atoms. Stern and Gerlach, um, where where you had um, silver atoms not going through a slit, but being split uh, a single sorry a beam of individual silver atoms. So we can talk about one silver atom, and uh, it, it's it's got a uh, intrinsic um, magnetic moment, so that when it's hit by a magnetic field, it's either pulled one way or the other. Or you might think if it was at an angle to the field, it would go slightly to one side, but it doesn't. It only ever goes fully to one side or fully to the other side. Um, and so the, the spin or magnetic moment of a silver atom is also quantized. Uh, it's, it also can only exist in zero or one or two units and, and so on. And, um, then you can put a, a magnet after that. Uh, so if, if, you, if you shine them through, you, uh, individual silver atoms, you'll find them going blip, blip, just in two different places. Blip, 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 uh, randomly, apparently. Um, yeah. And um, uh, then what you can do is you can put another magnet th with the other polarity to make the, the two beams. And let me stress, these are beams... One of them has got nothing in it. Um, it's it's uh, it, it's a silver atom and and a silver atom in another universe, actually. But they didn't know that. But you <laughs> you, you put a okay. magnet in the other direction to bring the beams together, and then you find that um, the the state of the silver atom. Uh, is what it originally was. Uh, I, I should have said, if you want it to go randomly up and down, you've, you've got to start it off pointing sideways. So you, you'd, classically, you'd think that if it starts off pointing sideways, it won't be affected by the magnet at all. It'll just go straight through because it's it's sure. like pulled equally up and down. Pulled in each but direction. In fact, yeah. it gets split always, no matter what... what um, direction you you push it you put it in sideways it goes through this thing you put the magnets the other way and then it always emerges in the same direction it started out with so it knows <laughs> it it knows that it 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 was once a leftward pointing rather than upward or downward pointing but if you interrupt it halfway through you'll get a upward pointing and a downward pointing randomly so hmm. that was the next thing that puzzled people and at this point, they knew that something really weird was happening because a lot of them had predicted that this thing won't work with matter. It'll only work with light. And, sure, and sure. And the, the silver atoms were the first thing that they tried uh, that wasn't light. And, and, uh, and it worked exactly the same. Uh, and, you know, the equations were the same and, and the experiment was the same. And then finally, now this wasn't an experiment. It was a piece of theory that uh, had to do with the description of the experiment um, 
including the, the experimenter. If you think of a particle as a wave, then it's a wave in three dimensions. It's, it's moving along just like a, a, the, the, the blip in, in the skipping rope or the blip in a water wave or whatever. But the mathematical description of two particles, um, possibly interacting with each other or not, hmm. the real description is that its, it's a position is this in one universe and that right. in another universe and this in one universe and that in another universe. And so to describe... So two, two three-dimensional spaces. Yes. I see. Okay, so we're beginning... I'm beginning to see where we're getting sort of multi-universes yes. jumping out of this kind of stuff. And so the, the next thing, which was, I, I think, the final clincher, was yeah. uh, really invented by, by David Bohm, who interestingly invented an entirely new interpretation of quantum theory, which tried to get away with not having parallel universes. But I, I think his interpretation is really uh, the Everett interpretation um, in a state of denial. It's, it's right. uh, very, very weird and counterintuitive and involves lots of things that we don't see and so on. But anyway, he, he had the idea of why, why do this thing with two three-dimensional particles uh, why not just use spins again? Why not have two spinning particles? And the, the spin of one particle can only take two values up, or like when it can, can only be measured to have one of two values and the other one also. So the combined system can be in one of four states and, and you can make them interact. And indeed, um, you, you can predict that they, they will behave, each of them will behave as though it were affected by both instances of the other one. Hmm. And that is quantum computation. So they didn't call it that, they didn't think of it as that, but that's what it is. Sure. Okay, so let's rewind a bit to this double slit experiment. Yes. And can you tell me about other, I mean... <laughs> I'm hesitant to use the word interpretation just now because you, you seem to think that these are better described as as copes. Um, yes, as or at least other theories, which are untenable. Yeah, uh, <laughs> the, the, yes. the the Copen the Copenhagen, I suppose, with emphasis on the cope. Nice, I, nice. I, I'm wondering if you can talk us through what that interpretation is and why you think it's uh, insufficient. Um. Why I think it's not sufficient. Yeah. Yes. Um, so the, the, well, two different things are called the Copenhagen interpretation, just, just to be complete about this. The, the original one is hardly ever advocated. That was advocated by Niels Bohr, and it said that quantum theory only ever applies to microscopic things, and that right. macroscopic things have to be described informally not by theories of physics. So you can see why physicists didn't like that, but it also doesn't yep. make sense because by its inherent mathematics, um, quantum theory applies to things on all scales. So um, the best way of... of uh, oh, oh, and then, then, then there was the wave function collapse theory, more yep. or less invented by von Neumann in the 1940s, um, which says that um, when you observe a photon in one place, the other copy of it disappears. So, you know, the, it, it really doesn't solve the problem because if the other copy is microscopic, that you still have all the many universes' implications, like when there are two to the n of them, there are still two to the n different things which are all there until you observe the the particle and then all yeah of them well, well this is this one. is the interpretation this is the interpretation that I'm most familiar with that I was probably taught at school that when we look at uh, when we look at sort of a wave we're, we're seeing this this wave function of all uh, a sort of probabilistic distribution of all yes. of the things that a particle can be doing and that's what we're observing but when we observe the particle everything else just sort of disappears and suddenly the particle is in yes. in one place now. I remember the first time I learned about this thinking that seems absolutely absurd, but 
it was what was being taught and I thought yes. it was just one of those things about quantum physics that's just amazing and counterintuitive that I'm just going to have to kind of, I'm just going to have to swallow. Um, yes. <laughs> but that's not the case. No, it's not the case. It, it's worse than counterintuitive. It just doesn't make sense. It's nonsense. And the, the classic way of seeing that it's nonsense uh, was invented by Eugene Wigner, yet another physicist, who also, uh, this was a long time ago, but he also didn't accept Everett. Uh, but nevertheless, he invented what's called the Wigner's friend paradox, the paradox of Wigner's friend. And it's not a paradox, it's an argument. <laughs> Only he, sure. he, he thought it was a paradox. But the, the argument of Wigner's friend is, right. supposing that you have a friend who's a quantum mechanical object. Now, we, we can't do this experiment in real life because, because we can't control the, the positions of all the particles in, in a human being to find as fine a detail as we, as we need to do an interference experiment. But suppose we, we did it, um, then uh, the, and, and let's say the, this friend was observing the stern gerlach experiment, so he, he looked to see whether the silver atom was in the upper, um, in the up, on the upper path or on the lower path. And when he looked at it, it would jump to being in only, only one of the paths. One or the other. One or the other. And he also, because until the jump occurs, there's going to be two of him as well <laughs> on the microscopic level. Right. So suppose you look at him. But you don't look whether it's on one path or the other. You look on. You look to see whether it was left or not. Just like the on the final screen, you can see whether it's. You can choose to detect whether it's up, down, or left, right. Just not both. So mm. on your friend, you look to see whether his consciousness is registering left, or up, or down, or what. Le sorry, no, you can't do that. Registering left or right. Sorry. Yeah. Um, and whichever of those you see, it will spoil the up downness. So um, I'm not explaining this very well, but uh, later I proposed an experiment which would, in principle, be possible. Uh, but instead of Wigner's friend, you have a quantum computer. Let's say a quantum mm. computer running an AG AGI program. So right. this, this quantum computer is a physicist and it's your yeah. friend and it decides that it's going to do this experiment. And halfway through, when it's, when it's doing, looking at the up-down thing, it will write, it will sign an affidavit, um, signed and sealed by a notary public uh, yeah. or whatever, uh, and it, it will say, I, Mr. Quantum Computer, certify that at this moment I am detecting either up or down. I'm not detecting left to right or both or uh, anything like that. I'm seeing only one of up or down. I'm not going yep. to say which, because if I said which, that would, that would propagate to whoever reads this. But mm. uh, since I'm not saying which, it, anyone can read it and it won't spoil the experiment. So then, again, instead of the experiment where you put the magnets up the other way, uh, he simply um, uh, reverses the uh, the dynamics of the memory element in his brain in which he remembers whether it was up or down, but not the one where he remembers that he saw up or down. Yeah. Um, so uh, then out it comes, out, out of the quantum computer, into the uh, detection magnet at the end, and it detects that it's sideways. So in other words, what he did did not collapse the wave function. Hmm. And yet... Right, so, so, so yeah. the computer has observed the, whether it's, uh, has observed the actual position. Yes. Which yeah, you might want to think would collapse this wave function. Yes. But then, what the computer forgets which it's or what position it saw uh, yes. the, the the particle in, but yeah. doesn't forget that it saw it in one or the other. Yes. So something has observed where this particle is, whether it's up or down. 
Yes. It's observed it. And yet, when it comes out the other side, it's still, uh, to, to, to us, observing the whole system is not up or down. Yes, in fact, it's certifiably what it was before it went in. Right, which means that something, this computer has observed the particle without collapsing the wave function. Yes, exactly. Which tells us? Well, if that happened, that would tell us that the wave function doesn't collapse. If it didn't happen, it would tell us that quantum theory is wrong and therefore that Everett is wrong. Gotcha. So gotcha. it's a test. I, I, it's it's a crucial test of Everett against all the other all the other interpretations except Bohm. Interesting. That's that's fascinating. So okay, so people are going to be listening to this, and and uh, it, it's a it's a lot, and I'm certainly no physicist, so I might not be picking up on the on the right bits here. But hopefully, people are following. But they're going to be listening and thinking. Okay, we were talking a moment ago about the multiverse. We were talking about this image in my head that, you know, every decision I make, there's a version of me somewhere else that's doing the opposite and, and ever expanding into these these uncountable trillions of, of universes. And now we're kind of talking about firing silver atoms and seeing whether they're up or whether they're down and getting a quantum computer to have a look. And how does this all sort of dovetail together? Where, where do we Where do we go to get from wave uh, collapse, collapse of the wave function view of what's going on here is false to multiverse? Well, collapse of the wave function is only one of the possible copes. Uh, the, so what we're really testing is Everettian quantum theory against any theory that has only one universe. Hmm. Um, any theory that has only one state of the silver atom, the observer, the rest of the world, the scientific paper he writes, all the things that could be affected by whether whether the whether the observation went up or down, those those um, are are all affected or not in this experiment, and sure. uh, in in that sense they are they are universes. Um, I mean, the other way you can see it, the, the the more usual way of seeing it is just that the same equations apply no matter how many. Uh, particles there are there, but to the layman that that may not that may not be as convincing. So uh, it's it's that that it's going to affect things. The 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 differential position is going to affect things differentially that that are affected by it. Um, note that uh, th therefore, in one sense, the term parallel universe, the term universes, is, is rather misleading, or it can be misleading, because. The only things that can be affected are the ones that are actually hit by a photon or a silver atom or whatever, and th those travel at, at, at most at the speed of light. And therefore, this splitting or striation of reality into multiple realities doesn't go outside um, a sphere, an expanding sphere. And in fact, most of the things in that sphere are not affected anyway, so it's only certain things in the sphere, but nothing outside the sphere is affected. So it's never a universe that splits in two. It's it's only ever a, a piece of the universe that that has some mm. some traveling information in it that splits in two. So what's the best way of picturing this in our heads? Because when people think of a multiverse, they might be thinking of lots of sort of orbs, you know, and each orb is its own universe, and they all exist in some kind of void or, or, or something right that that's not quite right here like how should we be trying to picture this in our head is there a, is there a good way of doing that uh, there, there are many uh reasonably good ways um perhaps none perfectly satisfactory but um so first of all if, if you think of the multiplicity of the multiverse it's best to think of things not splitting in two but of two things which were originally identical becoming different so things at, in the stern gallic experiment, things which were originally or universes or silver atoms, which were lot, there were lots of them, and they were all originally pointing in one direction. And then when the magnet happens, they differentiate themselves into two groups, uh, one of them being the uh, upward group and the other one being the, 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 the upper path group and the other one being the lower path group. 
And then later, they usually, they don't rejoin. But in this specialized experiment, in the, in the Stuart Gerlach experiment or in, in Wigner's friend experiment, they can rejoin and the up and down universes interact with each other to produce a left or a right. Well, let's say it started off left. They will reliably produce a left universe again. Uh, and so then the universes become identical again until something splits them again. So it's sort of like one big universe, one big space in which multiple kind of, I don't know, I don't know what the word is here. Like if, if, if universe, Branching the word universe branches, is misleading, like yeah. multiple branches of, yeah. of events are sort of all intertangling and interacting with each other. So these aren't sort of completely mutually exclusive universes all existing side by side, but these, these, yeah. you know, probably not actually infinite, but, but, you know, infinite in the, in the sense of, uh, in, in the rhetorical sense of, of being sort yeah. of uncountably huge yes. numbers of branches that, that interact with each other. And, and these, this multiverse is an interactive multiverse that we're, that we're thinking about here, right? Yes. Yes. Um, this rejoining, as I said, is very difficult to arrange and it only happens in very specialized circumstances. Um, yeah. Such as, such as the one we've just talked yes, about. But, but on the microscopic level, it happens all the time. Like in a, in a, right. uh, in a, in a chemical molecule, in a benzene molecule, I think is one of them. You, you have, you have, um, the electrons can be either above the plane of the six atoms or below the plane or both at once in, in different universes. So, and this okay. both at once state is stable. So can we go back and basically run through, I mean, a, a moment ago, we talked about the double slit experiment It's the one that most people are familiar with. And we, we explained what happens there. Can we go back and can you explain it again, but this time in explicit terms with reference to this, this uh, many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, what's yes. actually going on in that experiment? What's yes. happening in your view? So we release one photon yep. per universe, per, per Everett world. Actually, that one universe, uh, th that one photon is, exists in a swathe of, of universes, the, the swathe of all universes in which we did, in fact, release it. There'll be other universes in which we didn't release it, and so that, that will not contribute. But th there'll be a swathe of universes in which we release the photon, and in all of them, it will go towards the the single slit or double slit or whatever uh, whatever we have put there in front of it. Sure. Um, in some situations, um, okay, um, in the case of one slit, uh, there will still be interference because photons that touch the left side of the slit will interfere with photons that touch the right side of the slit because th that will make them different from each other. And mm -hmm. they will then, and that's why there's an interference um, pattern, even with one slit, but it's smaller yeah. and less pronounced than... Yeah, than, because than some than of these people. photons are sort of bumping up against the side of the slit. Yes. So, um, physicists of old called those different kinds of diffraction, but uh, we can just call it interference. That it's mm -hmm. it's the kind of interference. When there are two, uh, they differ by by more. Their phases differ by more, and so they they have a more pronounced effect on each other when they when they are rejoined. So yeah. then. Um, uh, so they come out of, uh, in, in the two universes or two branches, because each branch consists of a whole swathe of universes itself. But in the two branches, in the first branch, it comes out in a, in a sort of little cone. And in the other one, it comes out in, in an, also in a little cone, uh, but displaced sideways from the first one. So these, these ones are displaced by, say, a tenth of a millimeter from each other. So, I mean, it's big enough to see. It's not that microscopic. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and then they, they travel at the speed of light towards the screen. And w when, they, when they're reaching the screen, the ones, which, the ones which head away from each other don't do anything special. 
but the ones which are heading towards a given point where they can where light can reach that point from both slits right no, not all points are like that you know if you go yep. far enough sideways um, but if you have a point where light can reach from both slits the photons the the photons in one the photon <laughs> in one universe will interfere with yep. the photon at the other universe in such a way that it either stops it getting there, or deflects it to somewhere else, or it doesn't. And if it doesn't... Well, how, how, how are photons from different universes interacting with each other in this way? We, how are they sort of bumping off each other? Uh, sort of. Uh, they... they um, so the, the the universes, as you said just now, the universes are are in constant interaction with each other. It's just that most of the time, things we see, it, it all cancels each other out, and we we don't see interference phenomena. But if we look at things in theory, we see that there are interference phenomena all the time. Solid matter is an interference phenomenon. Well, well when we try to display an interference phenomenon in the laboratory we're trying to explain we're trying to display something that can only be explained by interference so we know that solid matter can only exist because of interference but well, what do you mean by that could... so, so solid matter can only exist because of interference how yes. do you mean so the the individual um atoms in a um in a in a say in a crystal yeah um are in this lattice and if they were interacting with each other by classical electrodynamic fields as was thought before quantum theory then uh the whole thing would would collapse into a sort of um puddle uh that there 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 aren't there isn't a uh there isn't enough of a potential well at each point in fact there's no potential well at each point to keep the atom there. What keeps it there is that it is in more than one place at a time, and so are all the other atoms. They're all in more than one place at a time. And this state of being in more than one place at a time, just like the silver atom in the Stroengalak experiment, being, being in the, on the up path and the lower path at the same time, is equivalent to pointing sideways, which is a thing that can't be expressed in just being up or being down. And uh, in a crystal, it could be that this other way of being, a way of be being in this place and that place at the same time, has a lower energy than either of them separately. And therefore, the crystal settles into this lower energy state where the particles are no longer in individual positions. Hmm. Uh, so, and that, because that's a lower energy, it requires energy to change the shape, and that's why there are solids. So, we require a multiverse in order to get solid matter. Yes. This seems to me like a, a revolutionary claim, and yet you were talking about it earlier as if it's obvious and you can't understand why scientists are unwilling to, 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 to accept this. But, but you understand that on, on the face of it, that seems like an extraordinary claim to make. Yes, uh, I don't think it's as extraordinary as relativity, uh, frankly. Uh, for really? some reason, it's, it's, it's resisted more. Um, and and there, there, are, there are different kinds of copes. I mean, there used to be copes in regard to relativity as well, but they were of a different kind. Um, uh, maybe I should say um, one thing that is very convincing to people, to physicists, is that when you actually use the theory, you have to write down the equations and uh, you can either not ask what the equations are saying happens in between the initial state and the final state, or you can ask. If you ask, you have to talk about other universes. For example, when you write down the equation that takes uh, light 
um, from a laser to to a 15 slit um, barrier, um, you have to write down 15 equations, one for each of the slits, uh, sorry, an, an equation with 15 terms, sorry, a single equation with 15 terms in it, and nothing less will do. And this is, hmm. again, why com quantum computers are important, because that means that quantum computers can do computations which involve 15 or 2 to the power of 15 separate computations which are then brought together to give an answer. So I see. If, if you're a quantum computing person and are inventing algorithms for quantum computers to do difficult tasks, you have to work out what each one of those 2 to the 15 branches will do. And there's no way of getting around. In fact, for, for, the, for the interesting cases, there is provably no way of getting around it. So mm. you, you know that, that the whole reason why you want the quantum computer to do this is that no way of following through individual paths or probabilistic individual paths or individual paths with collapse or, you know, whatever. There is simply no way of getting the answer in, in less than whatever it is, 2 to the 15 pages or 2 to the 500 pages, whereas the quantum computer can be run and can do the motion referred to by those two to the 500 terms in the equation all at once. Right, because it, it can sort of, so, so that those, and that's because those different terms all represent different, say, branches rather yes. than, to, to not use the word universe, they, they all represent different branches, which a quantum computer is able to actually just sort of have coexist and interacting all at yes, once whereas any human exactly being right. looking at uh, any of these terms is suddenly going to be in one of those branches yes. and thus no longer able to 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 look at the the whole system of branches interacting all together yes. and that's what quantum computing will do for us yes and how how far off are we from this technology really becoming something that's, that's I don't know. usable? I, I, I haven't been working on quantum computation for about 10 years because uh, I've been working on constructor theory with my other hobby horse. Um, and uh, so I'm not, I'm not familiar with the, with the state of the art. Um, mm. every, every so often there, there's a new idea and I think, oh, now, now it's going to work. Um, but it's, it's extremely hard. The reason it's extremely hard is that any kind of uh, perturbation of the quantum computer while it's doing its multiple computation will spoil the interference. It will, it will uh, uh, make only some of the universes different and the others will, will be the same in all the universes in which the perturbation happened. Right. So you've got to prevent, either prevent the perturbations happening, or you can do this magical thing called quantum error correction, which is a kind of quantum computation that, a specialized kind of quantum computation that removes the errors. Um, it, it, um, it's like an error correcting code, except that in classical computers, an error correcting code always involves redundancy where, um, let's say, a majority vote is taken. You, you have, you have five, five bits doing the same computation, and if one of them is different, you reset it to what the other four are saying. In quantum computation, you can't do that because to detect that one of them is different would be a classical computation, and that would spoil the interference. But fortunately, mm. there are quantum um, algorithms that do the same thing, that, that can um, uh, internally detect without ever telling you, they, they internally detect which qubit was different from the others, and they change it accordingly. And you never find out which one was wrong. Right. I've got, I've got to say, this, this all still sounds... I mean, I, this idea that we've got multiple universes interacting and multiple branches interacting. Yes. And I, I understand the idea that when 
I observe one of these branches, it's kind of just like finding out which branch I'm in. Yes. It, it's not like a wave function collapse. It's just that I find out which uh, uh, all of the options do actually happen. I'm yes. just finding out which one I'm in. It still seems strange to me, though, that if I don't make that observation, then at the end, I can look at the whole system as if all of the branches sort of all happened in this one universe. You know what I mean? Well, this because they're all the same by then. So you're, you're still only seeing one of them, but they're all the same. So like, like the, uh, the silver atoms in the Stone-Gerlach experiment, yeah. for a while in the experiment, they're doing different things. But by the time they come to the end, all the universes, or both the branches, or however you want to put it, um, are identical. They are both pointing to the left. So mm. no matter who looks at it in what universe, they will see something pointing to the left. So why does our observation of uh, an individual particle in the double slit experiment change from ch change the, the, the end result from an interference pattern into two singular slits, well, uh, the, two singular lines on the screen? Yeah, so in, in, my in thought, the many worlds interpretation. Yeah, in my thought experiment, um, it doesn't change it, or, or at least it, it it doesn't change it if, if you perform the experiment as, as specified because, mm. because you're bringing the branches together again. That's the key mm. step. Now, when, when we right. look at that in real life, we can't bring the branches together again because that would involve sort of a massive 10 to the 26 uh, pronged magnet um, converting us back to the same state that we were at the beginning, other than having remembered, you know, and all that stuff. So it's mm -hmm. not feasible to do that with an actual human, but it is mm -hmm. feasible to do it with a quantum computer. By the way, um, you said just now uh, there are the universes operating in the quantum computer, and then I think you you changed your mind and said branches. Branches is much better because, especially mm. in a quantum computer. The rest of the world isn't affected. If yeah. it were, the interference would be would be spoiled. So the whole mm. multiplicity happens inside the quantum computer and then gets undone before it presents its its result. Yeah. So it, that, I think that's actually a really helpful way of picturing what's going on here. Like if you, I mean, when I think of a computer, I'm thinking of like a big sort of plastic box and it's all happening inside of there. And there are these sort of multiple universes, so to speak, but it's yeah. uh, everything outside of that box is, is completely unaffected. Yes. So it's, it's, it's branches within one, one universe. And the, the trick is bringing those branches back together again. Yes. So in the double slit experiment, the reason why we in fact get two different results is because by observing one particle and which slit it goes through, we have sort of found ourselves on one of the branches and that yes. branch is never going to, to, to rejoin the others again. Yes. But if it did, whereas by some if it amazing, did, then yeah. if it did, then we would still be able to observe that one particle and yes. it, have it come out as an interference pattern. Yes. But because that's unfeasible, that's not something that we're really going to see happen. And the yes. reason why we end up getting the interference pattern is because when we don't observe that particle, we we don't find out which branch we're on, and those branches come back together again to produce this interference pattern on the back of the screen. Yes, yes, uh, exactly right. Though, uh, again, just, just because people will misunderstand this, it's not a matter of finding out. It's a matter of mm. the information... Uh, it's a matter of us having differentiated the, the different versions of us, which are always there. Would uh, if the information leaks out of a quantum computer, then we would have differentiated into people who see one configuration and people who see another configuration, and mm. then you could only get the right answer from the quantum computer if you brought that information back and erased it from everywhere it had got to, or made the 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 did something to make all the different versions of the observer identical again mm. so everything happens inside of the quantum computer and the exterior world isn't affected unless we observe which branch the which branch the the quantum computer is on yes and then like there are multiple multiple versions of me created one yes. which uh, observes one branch again, of the quantum computer one actually, which observes another 
we don't actually have to do the observation. It, it's enough if if an air atom hits the qubit in question. Right. So that if we observe that, that it's it's already the interference is already spoiled. Then that's yeah, why they have it's to. Too, have it's it too late. Happen. Yeah, it's too late. So it's not a matter of. So it's it's not it's not the observation that makes the difference. Yes. It's something else that makes the difference, which observation necessitates. Yes, w w which which would permit observation. But whether mm. the observation actually takes place is irrelevant. And what's the best term to use to describe instead of observation there? Like what, what, is, what is the thing that happens? Which, it's called decoherence. Uh, decoherence. Yes. And if you had to sort of summarize the definition of decoherence into a it's, sentence or a couple of sentences? It's where uh, some other physical object, like an air molecule, let's say, mm -hmm. um, or an oxygen molecule in the air, hits a qubit and becomes differentially affected by whether the qubit is up or down. Hmm. So after that, now, there, are, there are two versions of the oxygen, two branches for the oxygen molecule as well. Unless you can uh, make it come back and undo that um, phenomenon, that, uh, undo that collision, the phenomenon won't happen. Which is possible in principle, but, but far from possible in practice. Yes. Although you can do quantum error correction, which is kind of magic. It's almost almost the same. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a uh, it it sounds it sounds like magic, but then they 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 say that any sufficiently advanced technology is yeah. indistinguishable from magic. Yeah. Just to close out, what are some of the philosophical implications of this in, in your view? And the reason that I'm asking. Uh, the reason I'm asking you, I, I don't know if you would consider yourself much of a philosopher as opposed to a as opposed to a physicist, but the reason why I think it's interesting to ask you is because you understand this far better than or someone like someone like I will. And so when I think of the philosophical interpretations of the multiverse, I'm kind of picturing this, you know, bunch of different orbs kind of multiverse, which which you're telling me is is not what quantum mechanics is implying. Yes. So what are some of the philosophical interpretations that someone could make of a correctly construed many worlds quantum realm? Right. <clears throat> well, the, the philosophical implication, so I don't know whether you call this philosophy or metaphilosophy or whatever, but the, the whole story of trying to understand what the um, equations of quantum theory tell us about the world is a story of realism versus everything else. It's positivism, instrumentalism, um, woo woo, uh, you know, you, you name it, you name the bad philosophy, uh, it has derailed understanding quantum physics. Uh, you have to be, and I think this is true of, of all science, but you know, you you want to know what the lesson of quantum of the history of quantum theory is that to do proper science, you have to you have to be a realist and not being. And Einstein, by the way, at the early days of quantum theory, was a realist, and and this picture of him of as as being a stick in the mud and not wanting to accept quantum theory is false. He didn't want to accept anti-realist. Um, copes, as you call them, for right. quantum theory. He didn't know what the what the right version was. Unfortunately, he died sort of just before, um, I mean, I think Everett was already producing his theory, but he wasn't quite ready. So, you know, if he'd lived another few years, Bryce DeWitt says he's sure that Einstein would have, would have switched immediately to it, mm. but we don't know. We, 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 we can't tell. Uh, so that's one, um, uh, and also I, I, I myself am sure that quantum computation would have been invented at least at least thirty years earlier, if not fifty years earlier, if people had not been instrument, if if uh, the leading lights of theoretical uh, physics had not been instrumentalist, positivist. Uh, and worse. Wow, um, that's a that's that's a hell of an indictment on. Yes, let's say yes. I, I, clo I closed-minded thinking. I I think it is a scandal. 
Mm. Um, but now uh, maybe what you really wanted was not this uh, meta philosophical uh, meta philosophical implication, but but an actual one. That I, I think the most um, the most um, direct one turns out to be not very not very earth shaking. Uh, the one I'm referring to is since you know that every time you cross the road in some universes you will be killed by a bus that you didn't see. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, in some universes you will be saved from the meteor that, that hit your house just immediately after you left it. Yeah. So uh, what do you do about this? Uh, should you be um, risk averse? Uh, should you be happy go lucky and, and think that right. you know, no matter what happens, I'll survive in some universes? There is a mistaken uh, line of thought called quantum suicide, which says that, that uh, if, if, you're in, um, if your life is going wrong and you're unhappy, uh, what you should do is um, buy a lottery ticket and set up a machine to kill you in your sleep if you don't win. Mm. And so if you wake up, you'll only wake up in the universes where you did win. Yeah, and, uh, and <laughs> I, that, I, I see. That is using the frequency interpretation of probability, which is exactly wrong according to quantum theory. So the, I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that that's wrong. What, t tell me why that's wrong. Just, just, just in case anybody's getting in a, a, any ideas listening to this podcast, tell, tell um, us why that's wrong. The idea that probability in the sense of what you expect to happen and probability in the sense of if there are many copies of you or your many, many people who you identify with or whatever, that, that any one of them has a one over n you you have a one in n probability of being that one of of being that one of being yeah. that one um that that is a mistake and uh, it, it's it's a known mistake in the philosophy of probability and people didn't really know what to do about it but quantum theory solves this it it so happens that there is a, a structure within the physics of the multiverse that actually uh is relevant to decision theory. And um, I was the first one to propose this. It's now been called the decision, decision theoretic approach to probability in quantum theory. And um, you have to work quite hard to extract the answer. And the answer, kind of fortunately or unfortunately, is that the effect on your decision um, knowing that you are in the multiverse should be exactly the same as it is if if you knew you were in a stochastic universe where things happen by chance. So in other words, it has no effect. If you win the lottery in one out of 80 universes, that's not the same thing as saying that you have a one in 80 chance of winning the lottery in this universe. Yes. Right? In, 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 your, and in your universe, whatever that means. Yes. So, so is is that because the probability is slightly different, or is it because the probability in your universe of you doing that is, you know, either a hundred well, or zero? Um, no, it's because uh, it's very unlikely, <laughs> if I can um, misuse the term, that probability even applies in this situation. For example, hmm. suppose that this is done in a hotel with a hundred rooms. And they're mm -hmm. sealed off, and they're all quantum mechanically sealed off, so that no, mm -hmm. no information could get in or out. Um, and and uh, there's a machine that makes an exact copy of you. Um, so uh, let's say you're going to be killed in. Let's say there are two copies of you to make it simple, and one of them's got to be killed, going to be killed. Um, then you should act as though there was a one in two chance. So, so the the you know the mistaken theory says. But the trouble is that in if if you know that you're never going to be let out of this room, uh, mm -hmm. as is the case with universes, then yeah, um, 
you could, what's the cost? How much would you pay to have a copy of you made in another room, um, which was an exact copy and therefore it would behave exactly as you did for the rest of your mm -hmm. life? Um, you might say, well, that's, that's zero because, because that will not change any of my experiences. It's totally irrelevant to me. Yeah. Totally irrelevant. And yeah, because it's not me in that room. It's a, it's something like a copy of me. Yes. Well, yeah. Now you've said it. You see, because if if one of those is going to be killed, you're going to say that that it's there's a two thirds chance now that that the 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 one which we're talking about was going to be killed, and only one chance that he isn't. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and yet. To, it, you're indifferent to whether you whether you are duplicated or not. Mm. So yeah, yeah. So, so the, the versions of you that exist in different universes or, or different branches within the universe are not actually you. You're not identical with them. They're just sort of a, another person that happens to share the same. I don't know, like uh, uh, yes. the, the same sort of set of atoms working in roughly the. Yes. the the same way now, and, so it's, and say, so it's wrong to think of this this natural interpretation of the multiverse that oh well you know if things go badly for me today it doesn't matter because things went well for me in another universe that's not really you um well it, so it's an interesting philosophical question whether that's really you but yeah. but the the number of them is not the probability of being them mm -hmm. that's gotcha yeah, might, yeah, no, that, that, I, th I think that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Um, I did want to ask you about one more thing that's just come to mind, which is yeah. I think it comes from Nick Bostrom. He wrote a paper, and it was I, I can't remember the name of it, but it was something about how the multiverse undermines consequentialism as an ethical theory. You know, an ethical theory which says that the thing that matters morally is what the consequences of your actions are. So, so take utilitarianism. What we want to do is, is maximize pleasure. If there really is this sort of infinitely branching set of universes that, that anytime something could happen differently, it just sort of does actually happen differently in two different branches or two different universes. It seems to suggest that if I uh, cause suffering in this universe, there is another universe in which I didn't cause that suffering. If I cause pleasure in this universe, there's another universe in which I didn't cause uh, that pleasure. And so across the whole system, it seems like it doesn't matter what I do because any effect that I have on any set of consequences, so maybe the amount of suffering in the world, is just going to be equally and opposingly matched by another branch in which the exact opposite happens. And so if our moral commitment is just to maximize pleasure or minimize suffering overall, then as soon as we accept that there's a multiverse, suddenly we just have moral license to do whatever we want because anything we do doesn't affect the overall balance of suffering in the yeah. universe. It just affects the, uh, the amount of suffering in our particular branch. Yeah, so I, I first, so many things come to mind. <laughs> first of all, this isn't uh, an argument about consequentialism. It's about utilitarianism. It, it's about the idea that we should make decisions according to some kind of calculus of good or bad. And as Popper has pointed out, suffering and pleasure are not the reverse of each other because, as he puts it, suffering, other people's suffering, for example, makes a moral claim on us, whereas other people's pleasure does not. We, yeah. we don't have a, 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 any kind of... Uh, you, you might argue... Uh, how much claim it makes, but but um, we don't have the same kind of obligation to give somebody more pleasure as we do to give them less pain. Yes. So so that's one reason why why that that um, story of Bostrom's isn't right right from the get go. It it's mm -hmm. uh, um, then. Um, Remember that the branches exist in different uh, amounts. It's not just that different things happen, in, in, uh, that all the possible things happen. It's that different things happen in different branches. And in some situations, some, not all. 
situations, those like thicknesses or weights of the branches should be treated as probabilities, and in some mm. it shouldn't. Mm -hmm. um, so if the if the utilitarian calculus applied, then you would expect to want to maximize the expectation value of the total good that you're doing. Mm. Um, on on Popper's criterion, you'd want to um, probably minimize the total amount of harm you're doing. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, yes, I remember what the argument is. Now, these um, branches in which different things happen um, are changing according to the decisions, in, in, according to many decisions that we make sequentially. And in particular, our thinking, creative thinking or rational thinking, depends on error correction. Therefore, the, there are branches which become alike because our thinking applied to both of them says that, that this version is better than that version, so we change that version into this version. Now, this isn't, this isn't talking about quantum interference because we are decohering all the time. So the, the branches aren't coming together and, um, uh, and interfering. They're coming together and just increasing the, the weight of the branch with that decision in it. It's as though you looked at the, at the silver atom but then you manually took the silver atoms and put them in the same slot, which where they won't interfere, but there will be twice as many silver atoms in that slot. Similarly, mm. when we decide that a certain thing is immoral and we switch in the universes where we thought that was moral, we switch to, to uh, calling it immoral. And the other universe where we thought it was immoral all along will then become broader. It will have more weight, more probability in the situations where applying probability is correct. So this, um, um, this calculus is wrong for that reason as well, because we are, when we think, when we're making moral decisions, we're, just, we're not just calculating all the possible outcomes and their, their probabilities. We are changing the outcomes. We're making them, we're, we're uh, making sure that some of the ones we think are bad are converted into ones we think are good. By the way, the same applies to his thought experiment about the, or his allegory, about um, taking, taking uh, marbles out of, a, out of a jar, if you know that one. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. They're all white except for a few that are black, and, and black is doom. And, but the thing is, Every time you take out a white marble, you change the number of white and black marbles. Every time you take out uh, uh, any kind of marble, you're changing the number of black and white marbles because you are thinking. And just like I, I said just now about the, the branches coming together or not coming together, you, you're, you're trying to make knowledge better or you're trying to make the... Um, the outcome better, let's suppose you're a moral person, you're trying to make the outcome better. So you're changing the possible bad outcomes into good outcomes. In terms of the marbles, you're changing some of the black ones into white ones. So it's, it's not like Russian roulette. In Russian roulette, nothing you can do according to the rules of the game. Um, in real life, of course, you could. But in Russian roulette, if you obey the rules of the game, You've got a one in six chance every time you you spin the the chamber, um, but um, in, in real life, um, w the outcome depends virtually entirely on what we do, or or actually entirely on what we do in the long run, because even being wiped out by an asteroid depends on what we do and think now. There's no such thing as the probability we'll be wiped out by an asteroid unless it's already very near. Um, th that probability is affected by what we do, unlike Russian roulette, where it's always one in six. The probability of whether an asteroid will hit the Earth is affected by what we do. And think, mostly what we think and then do, yes. 
for example, how, how, se- well, for example, set up an asteroid watch and prepare rockets which can deflect the asteroid. Oh, I see. Right, I see what you mean. Um, so, yeah. Okay. So, so, so it's not uh, when you were talking a moment ago about you know. Um, there's a universe in which I decide that something is immoral and I don't do it. Isn't there just then another universe or another branch in which I decide that it is moral and that I do do it? Is there always, in other words, this equal and opposite me that does the good thing and the bad thing? So there's always a you that does the bad thing, even if even if that might happen in only one in a trillion trillion uh, of the universes. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, that that is that is virtually always the case, but um, there is it's meaningful to to ask whether there are more of you doing one thing or or less of you. Right, because the number of branches or universes isn't actually infinite. If it um, were actually infinite, then there would be, I mean, like there would be an infinite number in which you do the bad thing, an infinite number in which you do the good uh, thing. Even then, like. Um, if if it were a measurable infinity, that there'd, there'd be yeah, that, right. that's why I refer to the, the thickness be... of the of the universes. Even mm. if there's an infinite number, in the sense of the cardinality, uh, there there mm-hmm. would still there would still be meaningful to say that some of them that w- some branches are thicker than others. There's more universes uh, in some universes than others, and in some yeah. that. There are so few that it's mind-bogglingly few. The, the, the English language doesn't have the, the words to explain how few they are. And mm. in many situations, those thicknesses are probabilities or should be treated as probabilities. Mm. So especially, thick, especially situations where it is a good approximation to think of the process that is choosing one or the other as being random. So uh, you, I know. Sorry, can continue. Uh, so you may a cosmic ray may strike you and turn you evil. In in the overwhelming, in the sense that you have an impulse to do an evil thing. In the overwhelming majority of of those universes, your values kick in and and say, uh, actually, no, uh, you know, I I don't want to do X. Um, so that's turning. Most of the universes hit by the cosmic ray, which happen to cause an evil change in your in your brain, to turn back to being good again. That that's mm. how you think. You error correct. You you think. Mm. I mean, you don't think that's wrong, so I can't do it. You usually you would say, "Wait a minute, I didn't think that. That that's just a misthought." Mm. Now, I, I know that. This might seem like an impossible or even a stupid question. It's it's going to be impossible to know how many universes are implied by the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. But is there a way that you can give us an idea uh, to to help us conceive of just how many different universes or branches we're talking about here? Well, if um, if you think of um uh collisions that happen among atoms like like the ones we were talking about in the in the quantum computer most of them um lots of those happen all the time in in the world you know in 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 all the air molecules in this room there are many collisions i don't know how many there are per second but a very large number and each of those collisions produces a spread of trajectories following the collision where uh, and they're not all the same proportions in the multiverse either there'll there'll be majority and then there'll be minority ones and there are some in which by chance as it were or in very few universes all the molecules in this room are deflected to the other end of the room and i suffocate Right. So, yeah. Yeah. But in most of the ones in which they go to the other end of the room, they immediately come back. There'll be a, a sonic boom or something, <laughs> and, right. which which might in itself kill me. But, but that's another. You know, yeah. the, the there there is. It's not error correction. It's just elastic, elasticity uh, happening, which will mm. uh, re, 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 and so most. 
most of the randomness or most of the multiplicity of universes is immaterial to the to the gross outcome it it only mm. is in special cases like a cosmic ray striking a striking a neuron and usually not even then mm. so how wow. many well there imagine the number of atoms um in the universe and then the number of collisions that they make and then the number of possible trajectories from each collision then it's um uh, first number times the second number to the power of the third number uh it's very 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 large and most of them are to all intents and purposes the same some mm. of them actually interfere with each other but there's very few of those as well because they 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 would have to be a very specially fine tuned collision mm. to then have another collision then come back together again so uh yeah a lot in other words a um, lot yes that's no, it's amazing it, to think in terms of that equation yeah the timesing it one times the other to the power of the other yes I and mean, that's just un un unfathomably unfathomably huge it's one, it's one of the problems with talking about this kind of stuff and a lot of physics in general is that the same thing happens in astronomy uh where you you hear these numbers and and your brain just just can't even be amazed by them because of the fact that it, it can't even conceive of them it's uh it's it's one of the many uh it was one of the greatest tragedies of our ape brains, I think, that they were they were built to to deal with, you know, how to get well, enough food I, to not starve so. and not to conceive I, of I, stars. I think they were built to understand the world, and we can understand infinity as well, let alone large numbers. Um, but we can't. We, it's difficult to to. I think Descartes made a a distinction between. I can't remember the the terminology he used. It was something like conceiving and imagining, and I can't remember which way around he used. But he. He talked about like a, a take a, a one hundred and twenty five thousand sided shape. You know, you can you can imagine it in the sense that you can you know you can know true facts about it. You can do maths with it. You can you can treat it as an object and you can you can mess around with it just in your head. But you can't conceive of it in the sense of really seeing it in your mind's eye. You can't imagine that many sides all sort of in front of you. And I suppose there's one sense in which our brains can understand the universe. And that's the first sense where we can, we can know how many stars there are in a galaxy. And we can do maths and we can work out the gravitational pull of each of those and, and the, the trajectory of the galaxy and this kind of stuff. But that's another thing from, uh, that's, a, that's a separate thing from conceiving of it in the sense of being able to really understand what it means to, to think of a number that large you know it's i don't think this is anywhere near as bad as you think um, <laughs> that's uh, good that's true i can't really imagine a cube um <laughs> the the for a start you know if i if i try to imagine the far side of the cube then in some sense i'm imagining it as being transparent yeah, but it isn't. yeah. Yeah, sure. And there's, there's, <laughs> right. I, I don't know if you've if you've ever uh, been given the puzzle. Uh, if you if you think of, look at look at the long diagonal of a cube, mm. and and hold it up against a bright light so that you see only the silhouette. Yeah, and it sort of switches. You, it can look like no, it's not coming. No, that one. Okay, out. that's yet oh, another right. one. No, I, I mean a solid cube, where and yeah. you're, you're holding uh, opposite corners of the cube. The, yeah, the, the, okay. the most distant corners, and you're holding it up in uh in front of you now it's going to its silhouette is going to be a two-dimensional shape yeah what shape is that now mm. if you ask this question to roger penrose he will instantly tell you and he can even do that in four dimensions <laughs> let alone three dimensions uh so you know mathematicians who work on these things uh can not only work on them mathematically they can understand them they can hmm. grok them. Now, probably even Penrose couldn't do twenty-dimensional one, but but actually the answer is it's a perfect hexagon. Hmm. And um, another kind of person who knows that off the top of their head is a crystallographer, <laughs> yeah. uh, because yeah. uh, they know that a a I think it's a 
a face-centered cube or is it a body-centered cube? One of them, anyway, in the crystal structure is the same as a hexagonal close-packed cube. You only, only got to look at it from 30 degrees different angle and it's a right. completely different crystal. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, what, what, what you said a moment ago about not being able to imagine the far side of a cube is so fascinating because you, you're so right. Like the moment you're thinking about that face, you're not, it's no longer on the back of the cube. And yeah. yet there's no trouble. I mean, this is weirdly consoling that there's no yes, trouble good. <laughs> in, 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 our, in our brain not being able to really conceive of that. I still know what it means to say the other side of a cube. And maybe there is a sense in which we can we can grasp the, the the majesty of the universe in a, in at least that sense, even if we Absolutely. can't really yes. picture it in our mind's eye in the same way that we can't picture the far side yeah. of a cube. The, the pictures in our mind's eye are tools, just as the um, mathematical equations are tools, the diagrams we draw on paper are tools. They're all tools that we use, and we but we can actually use them to understand the world, not just predict. We can understand it to, in, in, in however much of its majesty we want. Well, what a, what a, what a brilliant place to, to wrap things up <laughs> after such a wide-ranging and, and technical conversation. That's, a, that's a, a wonderfully optimistic place to leave things. Um, I appreciate you taking the time. I need to uh, take you off this, this fridge that I've laid on its side and put it upright again and, and onto the other side of the hotel room before someone notices that I've completely upended this place. So I, I'd better hop to it. But uh, David Deutsch... Thank you so much for coming on Within Reason. It's been fun. Oh, thank you for having me. If you enjoyed that conversation, you can watch more episodes of the Within Reason podcast by clicking just here. But remember, the show is also on streaming platforms like Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Don't forget to subscribe. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. <laughs>